Hello, my name is David O'Kelly, and you're very welcome to KPMG's Capital Ideas podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to investors in Irish business. Today, I'm joined by Leo Casey. Leo runs BGF in Ireland. BGF has two and a half billion pounds on balance sheet and 250 million euro dedicated to the Irish marketplace. So far, BGF have invested in 20 companies in Ireland and does that on a minority only basis. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Leo, you're very welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Davis. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a bit more about BGF's approach, please? Yeah, so I might define it through how we're a little different, because as you please, said, yeah. you know, it's a very crowded array of capital providers out there and a, lots of jargon and lots of private equity and venture capital. And so, you know, what, what is BGF and what do we stand for and what's our reason to exist? So we came into being a little over 10 years ago uh, and, and, and d- d- different by design, I suppose, and maybe three call outs in that regard. Um, a really strong sense that that minority only piece was a missing piece of the of the investment landscape. So, as you say, we are strictly minority. What does that mean? It means the maximum stake we take in business is forty percent, which means that the founders keep most of the upside. So, if founders believe in the business that they have and believe in the upside and in the future, you know, BGF ought to be a good fit. So that's kind of point number one. I guess twinned with that, though, is a minority in style. I would say, and that cultural piece is hugely important. Mm. And we meet so many founders that very quickly the conversation moves past the capital and the deal structure uh, and to, you know, I've got a good culture in my business, I've got a good thing going. Um, is BGF going to mess that up or how is this going to roll? How do you guys behave? How do you behave when things go bad? Really good questions. And yeah. you know, we encourage founders to reference the hell out of us and anybody else they might do business with. And I think there's a you know, really important point in that. But I guess our style, if I was to describe it, would be very commercial. We don't sweat the small stuff. We empathize and understand the pain points in scaling an SME. Um, we recognize that most journeys are, will have pain points that won't be entirely straightforward. And so, and, and also probably very importantly, low ego, you know, we, mutual respect. Uh, we respect the founders we back and we respect their control of the businesses they back. And I suppose what we look for in return is people who listen to us, you know, be open to challenge, uh, be open to people who bring help and add value, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's the minority piece. The second big call out is the balance sheet versus yeah. the fund, and right. what does that mean? Yeah, and I guess, a you know, quick recap, not for your benefit, but for your listeners, you know, a, a typical private equity fund might have a 10 year sort of shelf mm. life, plus or minus, so three to four years to get the capital out to deploy it, three to four years to bring the capital home. And you know, plus or minus ten years, you draw up all the sums, and then everybody goes home or goes on to fund number two, and yeah. onwards to glory, and so on, which is all wonderful. But I guess what underpins all of that is a clock ticking at some level, mm. and you know that sort of mythical hourglass that sits on the board table, an IRR type culture, you know, where time matters. So, you know, you said it was going to be a five-year journey, folks, and we're now in year six. This is difficult. You know, we need to start engineering our returns. We need to do a dividend recap. We need to relever the business. That's over here in BGF land, it's a permanent balance sheet. So that allows us, right. it's all about cash and cash money multiple. So you put X in, what did you get back? Right? Did you double mm. your money? Did you triple your money? And it's very, very transparent and it's very, very clear. Whether that takes three or four or five or six years, relatively agnostic on. And I think that's much more appropriate in investing in SMEs, where quite frankly, it is so difficult sometimes to determine investment horizons. Yeah, and of, yeah. of course, we talk on the way in with founders, well, what do we all think this might be? Three to four year sprint in some cases. In other cases, there's a lot of ambiguity. You know, it might be, I'm 52 today, and I promised my family I'll be out by 60, you know, but I can't tell you for sure, guys. That's fine. We can live with either version. We can be flexible because we're a permanent balance sheet, and we can play the short or the long game as appropriate. And then maybe the final call out on you know who we are and what makes us a little different. It's just the massive network and infrastructure we have sitting behind us. And what do I mean by that? I mean, just the network of high quality chairs, the door openers we have at our disposal, particularly in the UK, um, subject matter experts, former founders, former chairs, 100 plus investors across 16 offices. There's just massive IP and intelligence and know-how in that for us to kind of leverage as we meet and approach Irish founders, because invariably the UK is not always, but invariably it's a part of the investment narrative. The businesses we back are either in the UK already, they're heading into the UK or moving through the UK and beyond. And 
you know, we have the network beyond the UK as well and North America and so on. But let's you know stick to yeah. the, stick stick to yeah. the kind of UK piece for now. So I think leveraging that, I might give you a couple of examples as the conversation evolves, yeah. just to bring that to life. So there's, there's loads in that for uh, yeah, for, sorry, for sorry, an opener. It's quite so a lot to unpack, yeah, but, so but three, but there's three elements, I guess. Yeah, and, and we we might go into the into the into each of the three that. The minority, being a minority um, investor, like it's a different style of investment. Maybe can we build into that a little in terms of, you know, if you were taking sixty to seventy percent versus forty percent, you know, how might that work differently over an investment horizon? Uh, and then even just in terms of around the boardroom table and who has the final say. How does yeah. all of that work? R- really, really pertinent question. So there's an economic piece, so that's fine. So yeah. that's, that's mathematics. That's, so that's yeah. that's, exactly, that's kind of yeah. ev- self-evident. I think the style bit. The behaviours bit is important, right? Um, and, and I do think it makes a difference because I do think that fundamentally there is a philosophical and a very tangible mm-hmm. difference between owning thirty or forty percent of a business and only seventy or eighty percent. You know, who ultimately has the power? Yeah. You know, the control. So we're very much at the former end of the spectrum. So we are back in the founders. So concrete example: first investment we made, Brindley Healthcare. It came around to the first acquisitions, the chain of nursing homes yeah. led by Amanda Torrens. Yeah. The first acquisition came around. And Amanda said, so look, I found something I like. So what happens now? You're going to send in the analysts and tear this thing apart and tell me all the reasons I can't do the deal. Or how does that work? How much work do you want to do on this? And we said, no, I mean, we're backing you, right? And this was an acquisition-led platform. So let's absolutely sit down. You can get your CFO to work up a two-page we can all stare at. Yeah. But let's kick it around for a couple of hours together, you, me, the chairman, and your CFO. Um, and and you know, let's figure out if this is a good idea. And the short answer was, you know, this sounds sensible, drive on. And she said, that's all. I said, absolutely. And look, we'd like to obviously have a weather eye on the structure and the legals and we can help yeah. and maybe spot some things that can help you and your CFO. So we're here at your disposal to add value and to help. But on the call, it's your call, we're backing you. Let's go do it. Let's go do yeah. the next one. Now, if three in a row all turn horrifyingly <laughs> bad, you know, OK, yeah. we'll probably have to lean in and have a slightly different conversation. But the, but the MO is we are backing founders to kind of build a bigger business trust. We're trusting you with our capital. You know, you trust us not to get in your way and to support yeah. you like we said we would. So this is collegiate validation rather collegiate. than necessarily an investor business plan and this needs yeah. to be done by month six or 12 or 18 or Back to the else. hourglass on the boardroom table. And then maybe, you know, make it a little more concrete. You know, we don't have a drag right, right? So what yeah. does that mean? There's a right to force us out of the business or at least Right. Drive that agenda, which is quite different. Most, which is quite different. Most, uh, you know, private equity investors recognise they're different in a fund, but typically they say what we need is you know being being able to time the exit uh, and being able to hire and fire. So if we're not happy with management, we're able to change things. Yeah. So not having a drag is a big. Not change. having a drag. So equally, we you know we don't have a drag, but you can't drag us either. Right. So it's back to partnership and trust and alignment. Yeah. You know. And that really is the essence of the whole thing, which means it's super important for us and it's super important for the founders to make sure we make, we've, you know, we've discussed all of these things that they've referenced us very heavily, that we behave appropriately in the market and, you know, fulfill our end of the bargain. But yes, ultimately it comes down to all of those sort of, it's soft power as opposed yeah. to kind of hard power, but, you know, and of course, you know, respecting the founder. Because guess what? If we don't fulfill our end of the bargain, when it comes to the next round of referencing, you know, people will call us out and we'll get found out very, very quickly. So I think following through on that promise is super important. Yeah, and, and does it mean, do you need to structure your deals differently? Do you have, you know, are you more like a loan note or do you, ha- do you have to have a dividend or, you know, how, how do question. you make sure you don't get pushed around as a minority investor? So, so uh, we're proper equity investors, right? So, you know, the things we do are very similar to private equity. You know, we, we're playing for the yeah. upside. We all want to have a great day out on the exit and so on. Yes, we will lo- use loan notes, but uh, but we're predominantly an equity investor. So maybe for the keep the conversation at a high level, I mean, I think yeah. you should think of us in that manner. Now, yeah. uh, we will have consent rights, you know, okay. and consent items, and these are kind of big ticket items that look. You want to go and make an acquisition? Yes, you do need ultimately our consent. Founders says, "How do I know your consent will be forthcoming?" All the way back to the earlier part of the conversation. If we messed around with our consents, you know, we wouldn't be in business very long. But at the yeah. same time, you know. Relationships can break down, things can get difficult, and you know we need to protect ourselves too. And so, in those circumstances, those consents are you know obviously highly relevant. Uh, and I would call out, you know, for balance, we don't have a right to force a sale of the business. But if after a defined period of time, I guess if after six years nothing has happened, yeah. we will negotiate upfront a right to a dividend. 
you know, from that point on only, you can't hold on to our capital indefinitely. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't look very, very yeah. smart if we found ourselves 20 years later in a family business, yeah. sitting in an equity position with no, with no, no yield or, and so on, if, you know, especially in circumstances where somebody decided not to sell the business. So look, yeah. all of that. So it's, it's very carefully designed. It's different. Um, but you know we've been at it a long time and we've kind of found a model that, that works. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, look, the difference is intriguing. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is that you know, for a management team who maybe aren't shareholders at the point of a, of a transaction, often you know, one of the things with a, a classic private equity deal is management will have an incentive, will have a share of the business and uh, looking towards that exit in four or five years' time. Does that work the same for you, had, had, uh, or, or is it different? Can you One hundred percent the same. Okay. Critically important. Really good point because you know the team you're back in today may not be exactly the same team on exit. Yes, yeah. you know it's all about wrapping the resources and people around the founder. So therefore, equity incentive is super important. We like yeah. all of the key people to be incentivized. We'll typically use growth shares, which will be premised off you know the value we go in at today, which anchors the valuation and say so right from that point on. The upside right. gets shared by the new managers being brought in. That creates lovely alignment, um, and you know people don't have to put their hands in their pockets and remortgage their houses and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's kind of it's a clever way of, of of doing it. It tends to work really really well. We like our chairs to have investment in the businesses we back. We like our chairs to share in that incentive upside as well. All back to the theme of alignment that you know all of the right people in the right seats and everybody's rowing in the same direction and uh, and incentivized to do so. Yeah. Uh, Leo, we, we know each other a long time and we we're preparing for this earlier on. I promised that I wouldn't be nice. So go for it. Can, can you tell me, like, there's, there's always situations where the, the chemistry doesn't work or, you know, just through any investor's career, they're always going to hit some of that. Uh, how does that play out in a, in, a, in a BGF type scenario? Clearly, there's lots of steps you try to get to to avoid that, but in, mm. in that eventuality, um, you know, because what, what leads to those type of situations and, and how do you try to manage them? That's a really good question. And look, hand up, BGF is a volume investor. We pride ourselves on the volume of investments we've made. We've made north yeah. of 500 investments yeah. over a little over 10 years. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say they've all gone perfectly well. Of course, course, of course yeah. they haven't. And yeah. like, this, is, this is business and life and capitalism. Um, common themes, that's a really good question and one we ponder all the time. Yeah. Rushing the deal especially right. the relationship aspect. Did you spend enough time with the founders? Did you speak honestly about what our objectives yeah. are? Did this founder speak honestly back to you? Was there a doubt? You know, did you go out for dinner together? Did you go for, yeah, did yeah. you drink wine together? <laughs> yeah. Did you ask the same question on three different occasions? So you get the picture. Yeah. I, and I think yeah. sometimes, and look, there's a lovely culture in BGF of not, you know, sledging people who make mistakes and that, yeah. but there is equally a very good culture of learning from your mistakes. So. I've sat in lots and lots of internal forums where people have stood up and told their war stories and Touchwood haven't been in that forum just yet. But I'm sure the day will come and if it doesn't, you know, not, not taking enough risk. Yeah. Um, but 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 that is that is I would say the top one, two, and three point is, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. we squinted at something um, or we didn't have the difficult conversation. So honesty, direct talking, um, teasing through the difficult questions like, look, what are you in this for? Yeah. You know, what does a good exit look like for you? Over what time frame? What else matters to you? What else is important? You know, so all of that good yeah. stuff. And, and equally in return, what did BGF want out of this? It, and it have, it's a partnership. Well, it's a key bit of high performance is that well, you've got to be honest. You've you got to be honest. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny in life and in business, just the old you get, you know, there's just so, f just speaking directly and authentically yeah. is just so important. So that's kind of point number one. When things do break down, you know, what, what do we do? It's tough. You know, yeah. we don't have big levers and trap doors to pull. So you're, you know, you're, Always opinion to people's better nature. Um, you use the chair is very important. Yeah. You know, it's not our chair, it's not your chair, Mr. or Mrs. Founder. Um, it's always somebody that's very independent and strong, and that the founder ultimately has the choice on who comes in, right? So if that relationship is fused well, that individual ought to be of a sort of standing and gravitas that can help straighten out these types of issues if they bubble up, yeah, particularly yeah, as between really BGF and investor. I've seen that work really well. If that yeah. breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go all the way. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, follow it through. It, yeah. Look, it, you know, it can end ugly. You know, yeah, yeah. I would say where that has happened, uh, you know, we have sort of walked away and, you know, yeah. tried to do the right thing and maybe bitten our lip or pulled yeah, a punch, yeah. you know, because back to the reputational piece, just move on and let it go. But, but look, thankfully, it's a rare few occasions. Oh, um, okay. it, is, it is very rare. Like usually, well, 
in 99 times out of 100 or even even few uh, even uh, uh, more you know commercially rational is what wins the day and I, I do think actually the chair has a, a has a very interesting role there and selecting the chair and because it is a it, they can't be completely your person and can't be completely no. the the founder's person tell me about that process how you, it's how you a really good person. question and probably so a slight difference as well versus private equity where, you know, traditional private equity would say, you know, meet, meet your chair and hope you like him or her because yeah. management team, because, you know, <laughs> you're married, you're married now <laughs> and they carry a big stick. So, yeah. so in our world, it's a little different. It's, um, it's, we will bring ideas to the table. And the founders indeed may have ideas to put on yeah. the table. And some of our chairs have actually been founders, little black books, not always BG. Yeah, but yeah. would you like to think that we'll access and tap into a rich seam of you know high quality chairs um after that though and we have a lady who's really good at this in the uk by the name of kate, kate poulson and she's a team around her and they've been doing this a long time and so we lean on her and her people to sort of help with that sort of you know that chemistry and fit piece we spend a lot of time on this so it's it's all about shortlisting a number of candidates we step out of the room the founders you know singular plural or certain members of the management team spend the time with the chair and really, it's a two-way street. These chairs, the good ones, are highly selective. And you know, and almost in a way, that's a nice commercial due diligence for us. If a really high-quality chair comes back and says, yes, I like these people, and yes, yeah. I'd like to put my own money into this deal, and yes, I'd like to chair it for you, it's a wonderful endorsement. But putting that to one side. So that's how it rolls. If none of the names in the shortlist work, we go back to the drawing board and go again. Until such time as we find somebody, because it's critically important that the founders say, I want this person, and look, in our experience in Ireland to date, it's usually, it, it's never gone beyond the first shortlist. Yeah. Know, sometimes it never gets beyond the first candidate. It's just a hole in one. And you develop a nose for it, you know, and you develop, we as investors do and I do. And I think it's something we spent a lot of time thinking about what's the right kind of personality profile as well as skill set uh, that'll work here. But once that fuses, it's super important. So no, you're dead right. It's not our chair. It's not your chair. It's he or she standing on their own two feet and you know, and almost from time to time leaning in on BGF and saying, you guys need to slow down here. And other times leaning in on the founder and saying, you know, you've got to listen to these guys. You're not being reasonable. And back to that honesty and yeah. authentic bit, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and being a committed balance sheet, not a, uh, not a fund, so there's no expiry uh, and so on, uh, means you can have quite a long hold period. Yeah. Um, how do you manage that over, you know, over a five, ten maybe even longer, longer period and, uh, on, you know, companies change over that period, founders yep. change over that period. So yeah, managing succession and that can, you know, succession can happen during our whole periods. Absolutely, yeah. Look, I think, having said the, all of that, and I would overplay the patient piece because in the end of the day, if people bring an institutional investor in, you know, it's axiomatic that something is likely to happen and something yeah. usually does happen. And guess what? It usually happens, you know, well within the 10 year period. I suppose it's the point being that the pressure isn't there if things take longer, and that's the key point. So, you know, we all thought we were going to exit in March 2020. <laughs> the COVID came along. Okay, that's torn up that plan yeah. for maybe 12, or yeah. maybe not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 2020 was a yeah. great year. For maybe a bad example, but yeah, well, for three Ukraine. months everything stopped and then yeah. it went crazy. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. no, the busiest m and period yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. in, in yeah. a generation. Bad example. Uh, war in Ukraine, pick an example. Yeah. You know, something that came along, you know, a black swan event that sort of just meant for that particular business, you know, it would not be appropriate. To, so we're just going to have to dust ourselves down and a year later uh, come back to the market in our own good time. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. just good business. And there's no pressure from BGF and there's nobody kind of shifting around in their boardroom seat saying, well, that's, you know, really what unhelpful we're gonna, yeah. and what they're yeah. going to do to protect our IRR. You know, there's none of that carry on. And I do think that's significant. Yeah. And you have some, in terms of your existing portfolio companies and lots of really interesting uh, uh, companies in it, uh, but quite quite a diverse portfolio from you know food companies through to medical device uh, 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 and so on. Is there a, are there common investment themes that you seek out uh, uh, you know beyond sector? Yeah, good question. And yes, the fundamental theme is not surprisingly profitable, growing. Yeah, with really good founders, you know, who are open to influence and open to, open to becoming better. You know, mm. recognizing that the things that got them to here may not get them to that version of themselves that will be two or three times bigger and that they haven't been on that journey before and need help to sort of yeah. move on that journey. Because Dahi O'Connor put it really well once on, on the Revive Active investment we made when he said, you guys have got some of the keys to unlock some of the doors I need internationally. 
uh, yeah. you know, to drive my business uh, into, into, into other geographic markets. And that was a nice way of putting it, I think. You know, Dahi drives the business, but we, you know, we, we, we help. So yes, we are generous. We invest right across the economy. And so, but, but I guess what people don't necessarily see that sits behind that is that 500 plus investment portfolio yeah. with 180 exits sort of sitting behind it. So pick a sector in Ireland, IT services, healthcare, food, software, yeah. tech enabled businesses, engineering. There's a silo of investments we've made across the water, particularly that we can kind of draw upon where we have former founders, where we have former chairs, our current chairs, where we have subject matter experts, where we may have operation partners within BGF. And so therefore, yes, the front end of BGF, we're quite nimble and we, you know, we, 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 we'll, we'll yeah. fly across the surface and drop into different verticals. But I guess that piece that underpins all of that is that sort of DNA, is this a BGF deal? Does yeah. this founder want to keep most of the upside? You know, are we aligned? Are they the kind of people that you know we want to work with? If the answers to those things are yes, then it transcends the vertical. Yeah, um, yeah. So and I've always found it very, uh, you know, one of the one of the strengths of your team is very de uh, decisive in terms of saying that this is a deal that we want to do, and you know there are plenty of other great deals, but they you know they may ju uh, just not be for for you guys. So that's, that's and a, I think that's, that's actually a really important point because you know, for, uh, don't get me wrong, you know, those comments make a private equity or any kind of just to show the differences with our model. Oh, there yeah. It's perfectly, there's plenty of businesses that we've met and it's all over after the first stage whereby this will look, I want to take a lot of capital out. Yeah. I'm of an age, there's a tiredness, there's a kind of a desire to really transition aggressively and regime yeah. change on the way in. You know, there's other people around town who are, do that really well. Really yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And are better equipped to do it than us. So I think as ever in life, it's all about finding, finding your tribe, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think when we find our tribe, we're a very, very good fit, and we will go very hard to win that deal, you know. But if it isn't right, one of the, back to you asked that good question earlier about learnings for when things didn't go wrong. It's trying to force a square peg into a wrong hole. If minority wasn't the right thing, yeah, 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 walk away. Because we all, we all, we all can get seduced by the deal, but we need we to know it's the right one. Yeah, that's right. And look, there's pressures to deploy and to do deals as as ever, but you know, it's all back to learning and find a yeah. fit. And you've built quite a team here. You've Dublin and Cork. Um, and in terms of kind of the common culture in the team, what, what sort of culture do you do you think BGF? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, and I'm really thrilled to the team we have. Yeah, we're brilliant. up to six yeah. now and you know some of them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they are. And, and it really is a team sport. You yeah. know, and I couldn't emphasize, my other learnings is, you know, no one has a monopoly on wisdom when it comes to investment. And it can be the most junior member of the team that just has that. Yeah observation or insight that just sort of is fundamentally important and also different thinking hats different styles different you know strengths within the team where we compensate it's not all about having natural rainmakers we also need you know all of that intellectual wisdom and technical skill sets and everything else so really nice mixed diverse team uh, the culture i would say is team hugely important in bgf no sharp elbows really good collaboration a titleless organization in many respects and i suppose yeah. You know, that is really just to double underline that piece about it's not a hierarchical structure. And, you know, it is about, of course, there's seniority and, of course, time and experience matters in investment. You know, the grey hair does matter. But junior people who show talent will be brought through the ranks super quickly. But the talent is, you know, that's earned. Respect is earned by what you do in terms of outputs. It's a very balanced even-handed organization and i would say i would say a low ego organization lots and lots of bright very capable people but you know when we talk in dublin about doing deals we talk about a dublin deal not a joe higgins deal or a lauren sharp yeah. deal or a yeah. leo casey deal you know or, or, or any of the rest of the team it's all about you know it's us together BGF, we get behind yeah. the flag yeah. uh, and we'll drive for our team and same with manchester same with edinburgh same with london but ultimately and this is pretty important, you know, the incentive scheme that underpins BGF, the long-term incentive plan, is yeah. common across all 16 offices. So yeah, we yeah. all feed from the same trough ultimately, so that, you know, all of the nice stuff on culture, I've just said, yeah. it is underpinned by economic You incentivize the right behaviour. Yeah. So therefore, yeah. if my colleagues in Manchester need help on an Irish acquisition for one of their portfolio companies, you know, we'll jump 20 feet in the air, and vice versa. If we need intelligence and leads on an acquisition opportunity for an Irish company, you know, they will help us. Yeah. And there's a nice culture of, you know, ask once, you don't have to ask twice, you know, people just do it for you. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and generally speaking, that applies. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm not sure many Irish people recognize just the sheer scale of BGF. It's a, it's a like two and a half billion on balance sheet. It's, it's a huge organization. It is, yeah, it is a lump, yeah, yeah. And you know, within that, 
we have our own challenges to manage as we scale and grow and you know data is yeah. really important you know and really good CRM really good use of power BI and just really good pipeline and funnel management and because we meet and touch an awful lot of companies and you know back in the old days you might have just written them down in your little black book must yeah, get back in touch with that anymore. one next year no, you no. need data you need tools you need software to help you yeah. remind you you know nudge you prompt you and all of that but we're very good at that stuff too yeah. and spend a lot of time doing that I'm conscious that uh, uh, we've, co we've covered an awful lot. Uh, just w one last question I wanted to ask you is that for some of you listening here today, so those guys sound interesting and so on. Um, what, are the, what are the top two or three things somebody should do before as they prepare to interact with somebody like BGF? No, that's a really good question. Um, so particularly with us, you, you must have a plan that we can back. Yeah. It's kind of sound pretty basic. No, it's but it can't just yeah. be a notion. You know, it needs yeah. to be... And almost if you don't have a plan, it's sort of self-solving. It probably isn't for us. So it's that sense of, look, I've got my business to here and I can triple my business over the next five years or, you know, plus or minus. And, you know, here's how I'm going to do it. I need your help to do, you know, I need to strengthen my board. I need to strengthen my team. I need to make a couple of key hires. I need to open some doors with prospective customers. And I read a really good boardroom environment to help shape the strategy. Can you help? Answer yes. So uh, th that piece of having a plan, if you haven't got one, you know, put the shift in to do it because otherwise it'll, the conversation will be staccato. I would say take advice, and I'm not just saying that to you, David. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's difficult. Investment isn't easy. There is yeah. an awful lot of wood to chop. There's yeah, an awful lot of foreign good. concepts and jargon. And, you know, those founders that are well advised, it typically ends up in a better outcome for everybody, yeah. for the investor as well as the founder, and less risk of a sort of a short circuit or a disconnect in the process along the way. So I'd say that. I think think deeply and carefully. Talk to a lot of people. Talk to yeah. different investors. You know, yeah. take up uh, the opportunity to reference John. and reference the hell out yeah. of, of whoever yeah. you're going to do business with. Because okay, the UK is a big old place, but in Ireland, you can get to the heart of things very quickly with totally. a few phone calls. And I think, yeah. you know, which is wonderful actually. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that it's same that with advisory, right? It's yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure you yeah. say the same thing to people you speak to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Talk to for for me. Talk to existing clients or former clients. Or talk to portfolio companies. It's a it's a huge benefit. Yeah, Leo, we could talk for hours. I know. Uh, that's been especially really me. Interesting. But <laughs> 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 no, look. Uh, thanks very much. That's been absolutely super. Great. Leo Casey from BGF. Thank you. Thanks, Leo.